Hello and welcome back to a special edition of GNAT TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Monday, October 3rd. It's also great to be joined in our studio today, uh, virtually, by Professor Matthew Dickinson, who is a professor of political science up at Middlebury College. Uh, we're really uh, grateful to have him with us today for uh, a little while to uh, talk about the national uh, political scene and the elections coming up now in just a little over a month. Uh, also, hopefully, have a chance to talk a little bit about a little bit about our statewide political picture as well. Uh, but a lot going on and a lot to get to. So, uh, without any further ado. Professor Dickinson, thank you again for making the time for our conversation today, and great to have you back uh, in, the, in, the, in the studio. Uh, and uh, before we go any further, I should mention uh, many of you, I'm sure, have already heard Professor Dickinson uh, speak at one of the uh, Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning uh, discussions that he has uh, uh, held uh, uh, you know, over the years most recently last month at the Manchester Community Library. So uh, again, Professor Dickinson, uh, good to have you with us. And I, I thought we could perhaps start, start by sort of building off some of the things you were talking about there last month at the Manchester Library around the election. And uh, just give us your sense of uh, where things are looking when it comes to the midterm elections uh, on the national level. Do you think there's a a chance that the Republican Party will recapture the uh, House of Representatives in the Senate or is that picture as, as murky as ever? Well, uh, as you heard me talk about at the Manchester Library, there are few things in life that are more certain than death taxes and the president's party losing seats in the midterm election. And I see nothing that's going to change that. Um, so, yeah, the Republicans have a very good shot at regaining the House, in part because the Democratic margin of control in the House is so small right now. I think if Republicans pick up... Um, eight to 11 seats. It depends on there's some vacancies in there now. Um, they regain the majority. That's almost certain going to happen um, based on historical um, past precedent here. The Senate's a little more iffy. Senate races tend to be a little more idiosyncratic. They tend to be affected more by the candidates. Um, the Senate electorate is a little more heterogeneous. Um, than many House districts. And so you tend to have more competitive races. And frankly, the Republicans seem destined once again to, um, in certain races, want to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory by choosing candidates who, even for Republicans, seem somewhat outside the mainstream. So while I'm fairly confident the Republicans come November will regain the House, and we can talk about actual projection of seats, the Senate, I think, is much more of a toss up here. Why is it that the the president's party, who is ever in power in the White House, tends to struggle in, in midterms? Well, we think it's some combination of three reasons. One is midterms are often a referendum on the president. And for whatever reason, people who dislike the president's performance tend to show up a little bit more than people who like the president's performance. And right now, Joe Biden's approval ratings are at about 42 percent. That's not good. Um, it's a little bit better than what Donald Trump's were in 2018 when um, Trump and Republicans lost uh, control of the House, a big chunk of seats. Um, it's also the case that uh, we seem different voters turn out. The electorate in midterms is about 20 percent smaller than the presidential year. And that 20 percent reduction is disproportionately among people who voted for the president and the president's party in the presidential election year. So that hurts them. Um, and then we think in the United States in recent years, the polarization of the parties and the candidates has led um, the public to um, balance, basically, whoever's in the presidency. Well, we want the other party controlling those other two branches of government. If we can, it's hard to coordinate that vote. Um, but. Generally speaking, we think there's a balancing effect going on here as well. So pick your poison. It may be one, it may be two, it may be all three of those factors that come into play. But for whatever reason, dating back to Roosevelt's presidency, you can count on three fingers the number of midterms in which the president's party did not lose seats in the House. Uh, and the Senate, it's, it's almost as um, likely to happen. The Senate is not quite as um, certain. There has been 
a couple more elections in which the president's party actually gained seats in the Senate. Remember, Donald Trump did in 2018. Um, but the, lit, the midterm loss phenomenon is also generally affects the Senate as well. Hmm, that's really interesting. Well, in a moment, I, I definitely want to drill down into some of those uh, swing states that are are going to be critical to determining uh, which party controls the uh, the Senate, at least. Uh, but uh, but before I go there, I guess, I guess I just wonder what your thoughts are and what's what are some of the main issues that uh, are kind of driving the outcome. Uh, when you were here last month, uh, you you uh, you mentioned inflation was and and the economy, which I guess is James Carville once memorably told us is kind of the the main thing. Uh, but um, but I was surprised that um, you seem to think that the abortion question was not going to be quite as decisive as I guess. I was thinking at the time, it just seemed that at that point we were hearing a lot about, uh, you know, that was driving a lot of women in particular to register to vote who hadn't, uh, and that uh, that might indeed be a deciding factor. But uh, is it your view at this point that still it's the economy and inflation and gas prices and grocery prices, that sort of uh, stuff that's going to be, you know, kind of the main predictor? I think it is still the economy. Uh, those are the issues, the pocketbook issues that tend to affect people in their day to day life, as you point out, buying gas, buying groceries. Um, this isn't to say the abortion issue didn't resonate. It did. Um, but abortion is an issue that um, the it it peaked right after the Dobbs decision, which turned, as you know, the abortion decision back to the states. And we saw a jump, as you correctly point out, in registration among voters. But I think that was overplayed by the media um, for a couple of reasons. One is that jump in registration among voters, uh, among women, happened among Republican women as well. Um, so it's not the case that all the women who are registering, let's assume they all vote, um, are necessarily voting all one way on the abortion issue. Um, there's a significant, and we know this from Poland, when we ask individuals men and women, whether they are pro-life or pro-choice, um, and we, there's different permutations of this question, the gender breakdown is about 50-50. In fact, for a lot of years, more men than women are slightly more pro-choice. Um, that varies, again, depending on poll and question wording and so on. But my point here is we tend to think of abortion as a woman's issue, and obviously in one respect it is. But politically, um, women aren't of one mind when it comes to abortion rights and, and choice. The other thing I would point out is in a lot of these states, the increase in registration has been kind of dropping off again to more normal levels. And typically women tend to vote at little, at slightly higher percentages than men anyway. So if you see a registration breakdown, 60, 40 women versus men, well, that's not that far off the norm in a lot of elections. And finally, the amount of reg new registration in a lot of these states isn't going to be enough to change the dynamics of uh, races. It depends a lot where this registration is taking place. So for instance, we've seen a lot of special elections um, since Dobbs, and they tend to have gone well for Democrats, but they also tend to have been in areas in which, for instance, there was high college student population um, in the college towns, uh, and those tend to be more liberal. So this has to depend on where that registration is taking place. That's a long answer, Andrew, probably longer than you wanted. But generally, I think that initial boost of enthusiasm and registration due to abortion is beginning to wane. And we're seeing registration dropping down to normal levels. And we're seeing a lot of those other measures. Um, Joe Biden's approval rating had, had bumped up a little bit. It's now leveled off. The generic ballot. We ask individuals, are you going to vote for the Republican or the Democratic candidate in the House? That had trended Democrat, and now it's leveling off. So I'm sticking with my prediction that abortion is not going to be a driving force in most races in this fall and probably won't be enough to rescue the Democrats from losing that House majority. Do you think foreign policy uh, is going to factor a lot in this midterm election and how people want to vote? I don't think it is, with the caveat that this assumes that things continue sort of in the status quo here. So we have stalemate in Ukraine. We have a stalemate over Taiwan. Um, trade issues don't suddenly flare up in a way that supply chain issues begin hitting us back at home. Um, you are correct about Afghanistan. That pullout 
um, was widely viewed as botched. And that was the precipitating factor in seeing Joe Biden's approval ratings begin to descend. But we've moved beyond that. And there are a lot of other factors that came into play. COVID, for instance, um, shortly after that continued to exert a downward pressure on his approval. So I don't think, and we, this might be a fault of the American electorate, but I don't think they're really focused on foreign affairs. Now, if something dramatic happens, um, say nuclear weapons are used you know, regionally um, by Russia, um, then all bets are off and uh, foreign affairs could flare up here. Generally speaking, when we have a foreign policy crisis, the immediate impact is to boost the president's standing in the president's party. Um, but that's usually a short term rally around the flag effect. And then it depends on how that foreign policy goes. Let's uh, take a closer look then at uh, at some of these sort of swing states that uh, are, you know, are kind of likely to hold a balance and who does control the Senate uh, after uh, the November election. It seems like there's a four in particular, but a couple of others that are uh, being viewed as potential, you know, that could go either way, one way or the other. Ohio, Wisconsin, Georgia and Arizona seem to be the four states where there's a potential for either the Republicans to uh capture a seat held by the Democrats or the or vice versa. Uh, and then uh, three others that have seemed to have jumped out there, uh, New Hampshire, our next door neighbors, and uh, Nevada and, and Colorado uh, seem to be also possible uh, scene shifters. Um, I guess, well, let's start with Ohio, because that's, that's the one that you know, strikes me as kind of interesting with uh, uh, J.D. Vance, uh, the Republican nominee. I mean, I thought I would have thought he would have been a, a very strong candidate, but it seems like it's sort of a, he's been struggling a bit, not raising enough money. Yeah, it is it is close. Um, he has, J.D. Vance is, tends to be up in the polls. Um, again, there's a lot of variability, and that raises the issue about polling accuracy that you alluded to earlier, and we can talk about that. But Ohio's been trending Republican. It used to be a bellwether state in presidential elections. As Ohio went, so went um, the election. No longer. It really has been trending Republican. Um, sure, Sherrod Brown has been able to hold his seat there. But by running on a very working class um, type of agenda, um, the the race is probably closer because J.D. Vance is an inexperienced candidate. Uh, and he has made some mistakes. He's gone full-blown Trump. Um, and, you know, that is a mixed bag in terms of support, but I still would argue right now, and Tim Ryan, a deeply respected candidate, um, experienced politician running a good campaign, but it's just not clear to me that he can overcome that ideological dynamic that it sees that state trending Republican. So I give J.D. Vance a slight advantage there, and I think he's going to win that Senate seat. And the other one that's uh, tr attracted a lot of attention is uh, well, the state door next door to Ohio, Pennsylvania, where uh, the Lieutenant Governor uh, Fetterman is running against uh, uh, Dr. Oz. Um, I, I guess uh, that was another one, I suppose, that uh, Republicans were fairly hopeful of picking up. But uh, again, Oz seems to have struggled to raise money. I don't know. Uh, what is your, your sense of that? Uh, looks like from what I've been well, reading, it's advantage yep. Fetterman at this point. Yeah, this Fetterman is consistently up um, two to four percentage points in polling in that state. Um, Oz has been trying to turn this to a question of crime, um, but Oz has a lot of baggage. Um, he's not, you know, he's viewed as a carpetbagger by some. Um, and again, he <clears throat> is not a, a natural candidate. Um, he's trying to translate te television persona into a politician, and it's not always working well. Keep in mind, this is a pickup for the Democrats. Um, the incumbent stepping down here was a Republican. So this is an important race. Um, in a 50-50 Senate, you need to pick up seats as well as hold your own. This, I think, is the best potential pickup for the Democrats in this cycle. And right now, I think, you know, Fetterman had health issues and you thought that would hurt him. Doesn't seem to have so far. So I think, um, barring some surprise Fetterman is going to win this and this will be a pickup for the Democrats. And another one would be in Arizona too, where Mark Kelly is, uh, you know, seems to be, well, uh, doing fairly well against uh, Blake Masters, his uh, Republican opponent. Uh, but uh, but uh, I don't know. Uh, Arizona is another one of those states that seem to be trending fairly red in recent years. But 
Are we going to see a more purplish uh, hue this time around? I think of I think of um, Arizona as more purple than I think of Ohio. There's an influx of individuals moving into that state, and they're not all Republican retirees. Um, a lot of Democrats have spilled over from California. Um, coming down there. Uh, Kelly's the incumbent. And frankly, this is one of those instances in which the Republicans had a shot here and they nominated a candidate, uh, Blake Masters, who, you know, his views on abortion uh, are in line with the activist group, but they're out of line with mainstream Republicans. He's tried to soften some of that. Uh, It was, a. I thought it wouldn't be a an obvious pickup for Republicans, but it was in reach. I'm not sure it is now. I, I see Kelly holding on here. And finally, let's just go to Georgia real quick, uh, where Herschel Walker is uh, running against uh, Raphael Warnock, uh, the incumbent. Uh, Georgia seems like a real knife edge boys state. Everything I read about it seems to indicate that, boy, that is a, that is one too close to call. Yeah, Walker, of course, has that name recognition, football star, but uh, not a great candidate in terms of his biography. A lot of things coming out about his biography that have hurt him. And yet, as you point out, he's running neck and neck with Warnock in the polls. I wouldn't be surprised if this went to still another runoff. Remember, if you don't get 50 percent, it goes to a runoff. And it, it seems to be heading that way right now. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, well, uh Let's just move on and talk a little bit about uh, about polling for a second, because that's been uh, an area I've been kind of fascinated with in the recent, last couple of elections. Uh, you know, back in 2020, uh, the polls seem to have given uh, Joe Biden a you know semi comfortable margin of victory, and then it turned out to be that well, had about 120 thousand voters in a couple of states changed their mind, uh, that would have changed the outcome of the election. Um, and in 2016, we saw the same phenomenon where Hillary Clinton seemed to have a, uh, you know, semi-comfortable lead going into the election night and, and loss, of course. So what is going on with polling? Is, is it just getting more complicated uh, to reach people these days? Uh, and particularly Republican voters, I would think, where, you know, they either uh, don't respond to polls or, or maybe don't even say how they're actually going to vote. Uh, I think all those, I think all those factors, Andrew, are coming into play. 2016, I would point out, we have these forecast models that political scientists use that are not based entirely on polling, and and the the forecast models got the popular vote right. But as you point out, you just move that popular vote, uh, forty thousand votes in 2016, and it flipped several states in Trump's direction. The polling was off mostly in 2016 because pollsters got the educational breakdown wrong. We just did not anticipate the turnout among individuals who had less than a college education in those rural states in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. And that was enough to flip those states to Trump. Um, So that's one reason. Pollsters are having trouble figuring out the demographics um, in recent elections that turn out among, this is the Trump factor, the populism factor. The second, as you allude to, is um, cell phones. Um, cell phones have made it difficult for all sorts of reasons. Used to be that polls would just rely on landlines. You could do a random sample. People would answer the phones, but people who are answering phones now on landlines is dropped precipitously. You can't randomly um, sample cell phones as accurately. Uh, and so a lot of pollsters are opting for opt-in um, internet-based surveys, and we're still working the bugs out on that. So that's a problem too, and and there is the there's some evidence, although I think it's less influential than you might think of the shy Trump voter, um, the person who just didn't want to admit they were voting for Trump. I don't think that was as big a factor as many people thought, but it certainly was a factor, particularly in some of those battleground states among rural voters. Um, one one question I've I've often I've been wondering about a lot, also kind of uh, to build on what you were just saying there. Uh, is the durability of Trumpism. Uh, I mean, clearly we're, <laughs> Donald Trump hasn't gone away. <laughs> uh, he seems to be staying in the headlines pretty regularly, sometimes under, not only the best, uh, under the best circumstances, but uh, nevertheless there. But do you see Trumpism uh, sort of being an a ongoing factor uh, in American politics for the next, I don't know, five to 10 years at least, where, 
some of the, the reasons why people have uh, supported him uh, oh, since 2016 are, are going to linger on. Uh, and whether or not he's part of the uh, political picture or not, uh, you know, that, that will still be important and getting his blessing and endorsement will be important for Republican candidates. Well, I think you've put your finger on something very important. When we talk about Trumpism, I separate that out from Trump. I mean, the record of candidates defeated for president coming back and winning re-election is not good. And I do not hold out much hope that Donald Trump is going to be able to reestablish a viable presidential candidate, although things could change. His endorsement matters, but it really varies. Um, you know, we've seen in this past election cycle, he's picking and choosing candidates, sometimes just choosing them because he thinks they're going to win. Um, but he doesn't always pick winners. So I think the more important thing is Trumpism. Um, that's constellation of issues that he ran on against trade, uh, strength in the borders, the economic populism, white nationalism. I think that's here to stay for a while. Uh, and it's here to stay because it preceded Trump. Um, the Democratic Party has been hemorrhaging sort of that New Deal coalition working class voter for several elections now. Uh, Trump just happened to come on and articulate um, a, a set of issues that really matched very well where these forgotten voters were in these manufacturing regions and so on. But it's not just Republicans and Trumpism, Andrew. Uh, it's Democrats. Democrats have to run on a, a set of issues that voters find appealing. I think one of the undersighted currents of Trumpism, and it runs against what we like to think about here in the very white liberal state of Vermont, is that in Trump's four years as presidency, voters of colors drifted towards the Republican Party. Now, we shouldn't overstate this and mistake the uh, loose side of the forest for the trees here. Blacks still overwhelmingly voted Democrat. A plurality of Hispanics voted Democrat. Um, but the trends are unmistakable, particularly among Latino voters. Um, they are trending Republican and they're trending Republican um, if pollsters are to be believed because they don't like what the Democrats are offering them, sort of this um, what James Carvel calls faculty lounge issues that just don't appeal to working class Latinos who are not um, wedded to this identity politics and climate change and all the things that appeal to us in Vermont. So I think Trumpism is here to stay, not just because of Trump, but because of what Democrats have been running on as well. So what do you think the Democratic Party uh, lost sight of all of that? Uh, I mean, when you talk about the New Deal coalition, you know, urban factory workers and uh, and and the like, I mean, it just seemed like, uh, as you as you say, over the over a fairly now long period of time, a good 10 or 20 years, those voters uh, have drifted away. Um uh, and particularly in rural states, too, it seemed like uh, the brain trust in the Democratic Party just seemed to kind of uh, shrug their shoulders and go, huh, no big deal. We don't need to win in rural states or or even though we don't need to lose as badly in some rural states. I, you know, I, it was it was shocking to me to look at the electional map uh, back a year ago at the in the governor, the Virginia governor's race and, and to look at the sea of red in all the rural parts of Virginia couple of islands of blue around Richmond and uh, up close to Washington, D.C. But, you know, I was thinking, boy, if they had just simply lost some of those counties out in the western end of the state by, you know, 40 points instead of 50, that might have changed the result. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, that's partly that educational shift that we're seeing with um high school or less educated voters leaving the Democratic Party. I think it's a combination of circumstances here. The candidates that have been running in the Democratic Party have been running on issues that are, uh, and uh, again, this isn't universal, but are, they're running a lot of them on issues, identity politics issues that don't appeal to voters who are struggling to make ends meet. Um, you know, where did J.D. Vance come from? Um, he he wrote about this phenomenon before he wrote it. Yeah. yeah. Great book. Uh, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. And he, he captured something that um, some political scientists have written about as well. So uh, it's it's a it's the Democratic Party being viewed correctly or not as a party more concerned with issues um, that aren't appealing to the pocketbook issues, the material issues. Um, and candidates sort of symbolizing that. You think of AOC and the squad. Um, 
Now, they are not all what the Democratic Party is, but they're very visible um, on social media. And I think partly, too, um, the the press has something to do with this. As you point out, the center of gravity of the Democratic Party is on the coast now in major urban areas. That's where they're racking up these votes. That's where our major media outlets are as well. And I think sometimes they just tend to caricature the Trump supporters as, um, you know, these uh, bigoted, underinformed, homophobic um, individuals. Uh, and if you're a, somebody living out there in the hinterlands, you don't like to be characterized that way. And it, the the more that this media characterization is, is is embraced by candidates in the Democratic Party, I think the harder it becomes for the Democratic Party to appeal to these voters. Uh, so I think there's a lot of issues going on here. We shouldn't lose sight. However, the Democrats have won the popular vote in the presidency um, now for several elections running. So it we see the coalitions of both parties changing. Uh, it's not clear that the Democrats are on the losing end here. Um, but uh, Trumpism is here to stay, I think. Mm. Whether it, it's enough to regain majorities, that's another question. I did want to get uh, give you a chance to tell you tell us what your thoughts were on some of our local state elections are here in Vermont. Um, the governorship, the lieutenant governorship, uh, the congressional seat, and the Senate seats that are open. Uh, I guess a couple of months ago, I would have said, "Well, looks looks like uh, Phil Scott, David Zuckerman, Becca Ballant, and uh, uh, Peter Welsh uh, probably will." semi at least cruise to victory but uh is that your sense of it that uh are any of these races tightening up a bit well i think it's hard to tell without polling i did watch the lieutenant governor's debate i thought joe benning did a very good job i think that race might be closer than you might think i'm not sure that um zuckerman uh, the former lieutenant governor was hurt by that governor's race in which he lost dramatically but i think that's going to be a tight race the other three i i'm with you uh, brenda siegel is running a spirited campaign but she's running as a social activist and uh phil scott just has that um support of the democrats really in polling so i think he's going to win uh and then peter welch and becca ballant in a blue state i just don't see um gerald malloy or liam madden who <laughs> basically says i'm not a republican but i'll use whatever vehicle i can get into uh i don't see them winning that well, unfortunately, I'm going to leave it there. Boy, uh, this is fascinating. I, I really would love to talk for another half an hour about some of this, but uh, maybe we'll have another opportunity after the election to do a, a post-mortem discussion. I and would love we, that. Then we can talk about the Electoral College, which I find uh, really, I'm scratching my head about whether or not that is an idea that has outlived its time. I mean, uh, even though we live in a state that benefits, I guess, from the Electoral College, where you know, we, we have the same uh, clout in the Senate as uh, California or New York. You know, the the way that works uh, seems to be getting more problematic to me. But it might have seemed like a great idea in 1787, I suppose. But uh, times have changed a bit. They have. <laughs> well, again, uh, Professor Dickinson, uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on our program here. And, uh, well, uh, yeah, we'll make a plan to talk sometime after November 8th and, uh, you know, figure out what happened. I look forward to it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you to all our viewers for being with us today. Uh, hope you found our show interesting. And, uh, well, we'll see you again the next time. Meanwhile, take care. <laughs>